I know we all, you know, when someone is sick for a long time, we all know inevitably what's going to happen. But when it does happen, it's a surprise. And I remember just how long ago I was sitting there. And, I, you know, I shed a bit of a tear. I really did. It's one of those people that really impacted your life. And um, you never forget them. And they, they touch something in your heart. So I always remember you, D. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to a very special edition of A Word on Westerns. You know, we lose people every year because they made films back when most of us were growing up. We love the Westerns, but it's a dying breed. Hopefully, Westerns are going to come back. It'll never be like they used to be. And one of the reasons they were so great is the stunt people who worked in them. One of our friends, one of the very first guests that we had was Dean Smith. Now, Dean Smith, he was a gold medalist for the 1952 Helsinki Relay. He won a gold medal for that. And then Jim Garner, Jim Bumgarner at the time, was his buddy. He came to see him in Los Angeles, got hooked up doing stunts on the tales of Wells Fargo. He doubled Dale Robertson, making him look great. But his dream, Dean's dream, was to be in movies. And so he wanted to be in John Wayne movies. You know what happened? He was in them. The Alamo was the very first one, but Dean kept working. He was on screen in a film called Old Zana's Raid. Had a terrific stunt in that film, too. We have some people today who worked with Dean who are going to share some stories. And from Old Zana's Raid, we've got our good friend Bruce Davis. And Bruce, glad you're here. Pal. Good to see you guys. I met Dean on uh, the movie where I had the best time of my life, and that was 1972 in Ozana's Raid. It was filled with character actors and all the best stuntmen, and they were young, just going, a lot of them just going on. There's only a few of us left in the platoon. Richard Farnsworth was uh, uh, Diamond's father. I saw him hit a horse one time. It bit him, and he was a sweet old man till he hit a horse. And that was, <laughs> anyway, um, and Diamond doubled me years later in Janet D. But uh, there were um, Dean Smith had a talking part in the movie, and every every stunt man that was in there, and there was uh, Billy Burton and. Walter Scott and uh, Tony Epper and Patty Elder and all the great stunt people were in there and they they would uh, rag him because he had lines and they say how do, how do you say that Mr. Root Kaiser how, how's that go again and he said just get off my back I'm trying to be an actor here in this and he did he had a great acting part in it and then he had uh, a stunt in which he had to run along and the Apaches attack and uh, he the woman says save me save me he runs back shoots her in the head and rides off and and then oh, boy, yeah. they shoot his horse out from under him he tumbles all over himself and gets up and as they're coming for him he gets the gun puts it in the mouth and shoots himself in the head why would he run a role like that? <laughs> well, because of all of that came before in which he, Mr. Rukhauser, you really ought to leave the head. Get out of here. The Apaches are coming. You know? But uh, every, every stuntman, because that's what he was used to being mostly, gave him such a hard time about him being that. But uh, there was never a, a sweeter, gentler man. And everything he did, uh, he was so, uh, you know, just... It made me feel at home. And he says, well, I'm, this is, you know, I'm just acting here too. So I was sort of, you know, on, on shaky ground and, and just made himself feel comfortable because it, the movie was basically using all of John Ford's characters um, to tell a, 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 a story kind of like Vietnam. You know, deeper we get in, everybody gets wiped out. I was playing... Uh, I guess uh, Patrick Wayne's part is the young shaved tail lieutenant, and all of us were in a cavalry uh, on a uh, following an Apache raid. 
So we would, a lot of people would get lost as they went along the way. And it's the best time I ever had in my life mm -hmm. because I made friends with people that were the real deal. And they went on years later to have great careers. And uh, he was always someone that reminded me that there was a gentleness underneath all of the tough knock them down, fight in the bar room brawl, but there was a gentle, and I think if I thought of Dean as anything, it was generous. Mm -hmm. He had a great generosity of soul. And he was already coming in as a star, mm -hmm. you know, to a whole new world. Um, so uh, I, I, I thought of him over the years. I've met him a couple of times here and there, but uh, actors and stuntmen are people that kind of like are kind of war buddies in a way. We we don't see each other for years, and then 10 years later, we'll pick up mid-sentence where we left off. But um, I, I always, he's always been close to my heart. I went down there, and they gave me these leotards, and they had me this in this bustle, and I went and got that big red wig, and it hung down to here. And uh, stuntmen, they just kidded me all over the place. It looked like I had walnuts in my socks. <laughs> and uh, so... So anyway, but I made more money on McClendock than any of the other stuff, man. So you can't, can't complain on that, you know. Next to talk about Dean Smith is Anita LaCava Swift, who uh, has been a dear friend of Dean's for a long time. And Anita, didn't you go to the memorial for Dean in Texas? Was that in Graham? It was. It was in Graham with all his friends and family and uh, Diamond Farms. Farnsworth was there. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful memorial for him and uh, filled with lots of stories and laughs. And um, it was, I'm glad I could, I could make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've known Dean since um, I was two years old. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so a long time. In fact, um, I can say we were in our first John Wayne movie together. Which was what? The Alamo. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And that was um, my first John Wayne movie and last. And he went on to do uh, 11 more, I believe. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, that was his first, though. Yes, he that was, was so first. excited, I oh, remember. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And he became a, a very close friend of uh, our family mm -hmm. and um, went on to do um, two very wonderful um, uh, rodeos mm -hmm. for the John Wayne Cancer uh, Foundation. And um, he, it was so wonderful. He uh, sure was. That. Ben Johnson used to do those. And then when Ben passed, Dean took up the mantle. And he and his wife, Debbie, said they didn't realize how much work there was really involved in that. Yeah. There was a lot, but how wonderful. It was terrific. Absolutely that. terrific. And then, you know, unfortunately, he ended up having cancer. But because he was in such fabulous shape, you know, he fought that for 18 years. Mm -hmm. We always thought, well, wow, boy, this may be the last time we see Dean, but then he would surprise us. Oh, my gosh. Never and never heard a word of complaint never, out of him. Never. Uh, and always looked so great. Mm -hmm. He's such a handsome guy. Um, yeah, and never, ever did I hear him complain. And you never heard anybody say bad things about Dean either. Never, mm -mm. ever heard anybody. Uh, he was uh, always so highly thought of and... Um, uh, what a kick. I always had a good time with Dean. He and I both remarried at about the same time to beautiful, smart blondes. Absolutely. And, 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 and had handsome sons. Uh, I know. Right? It's, it's great. I've got pictures of them. I'm, I'm looking for them. Uh, Finus and Robbie. Finus is about a year younger than Robbie, but now he's so tall. Oh, my gosh. So uh, handsome. Good looking. And, and Debbie, what a sweetheart. Oh, you know? my gosh. It's so funny because, you know, he was a great stuntman, but what an athlete. I mean, uh, we were, uh, one of the speakers at his uh, memorial service was talking about the fact that he was, he, he was a gold medal uh, winner at 1952 Helsinki Olympics. But he was also talking about the fact that when he was 42 years old, he ran in the Mount Sac 100 meter at, and won 9.9 .9 seconds, 42 years old. He was the fastest man alive. I mean, 
And apparently many stories about him on set revolved around the fact that, you know, they'd be in a bar somewhere and he'd be, you know, they'd be going, hey, yeah, who's the fastest guy in here? We're going to have a race. And he's our, he's, you know, he's our guy and they'd start taking bets. And, you know, the youngest guy in the room was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and he always won. Standing flat yeah. footed. Yeah. And jump up on top of the bar. Oh. With his legs like springs. Oh, yeah. No, he's the guy in all the movies jumping on the back of that horse and taking off. One of my favorite scenes, though, with him is in another film with your grandfather, El Dorado, where James Caan throws the knife in, in the, you know, it's great. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a good oh, moment. Good absolu- moment. Absolutely. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. What a yeah. sweet guy. Thank you, yes. Anita, for sharing You're- this. I wish I could have been there, too. I know. I know. But I, uh, Rob, have been very fortunate to have had the career in uh, in the movies. When I left Texas and got out of the university, I knew that I wanted to be like Roy and Gene and all those guys. And uh, they thought, well, here, you got a college degree and you could go into any other business. But I came to Hollywood and was a stuntman for the last 55 years, and I'm very proud of it. I wouldn't have done it any other way. When you talk stuntmen... You talk legends, and Dean Smith was certainly one of the legends. Another legend Dean worked with and was good friends with Richard Farnsworth and his son, Diamond Farnsworth. Diamond is here right now to talk about (laughs) Dean. Yes, Dean is a very good friend of mine, and uh, I met Dean when I was about 10 years old. He used to come over to our house in the Hollywood Hills, where he knew where it is, and uh, I used to hear all these great stories when I was a young kid, not knowing what I was going to do as a grown-up, but uh, listening to Dean and my dad talk, I, you know, changed my mind a little bit. When I got out of high school, my dad took me on paint your wagon to do stunts, and that was how I got introduced to the picture business, and after that, I said, Jesus. This is a heck of a way to make some good money. So I, I stuck it out for 55 years. And, uh, and you've done quite well. Too. Yes, I've been very fortunate. <laughs> um, Dean was probably one of the greatest stuntmen. He, he would have made a great actor. And the only thing that held Dean back as an actor was his voice. What? What do you mean? Yeah, he talked like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> he had his high-pitched voice. And that's what all the stunt guys kid him about, was, hi, I'm Gene Smith. You know, and he'd go, okay. But his talent, I'd match him with anybody in Hollywood, anybody. And uh, he did, I remember one day where I think we were on, it was either Heck Ramsey or uh, Gunsmoke. And we were up in, in Utah, and it was, he had a horse up a hill in the sand, he ran in the sand, croopered this horse on the back, and everybody was amazed. In the sand, you deep sand. And I walked up there, and I said, well, if he can do it, I can do that. <laughs> I ran into the horse's tail. <laughs> I couldn't get up over it. And he was such a marvelous man. And, uh, and the people at his funeral said so many nice things about him, how great he was, and, and, and he, he definitely will fall down as a legend in Hollywood. That's how great he is. I mean, you think about all the great actors, Dean Smith would be right up there with him as a stunt man, you know, right next to Yakima Canut, who, you know, was a great stunt man. Had the same voice as Dean. He had a little higher pitch, but it wasn't as high as Dean. <laughs> you know, and I mean, we can laugh about that now, and we used to laugh at it in front of him, you know, and I'll never forget this. Dean always wanted to be a singer. We were doing, I was doing a show with him called Simon and Simon. And he says, what are you doing? I said, at lunch. I said, nothing. He says, good, go for a ride with me. I said, well, where are we going? Well, we're going to go down to Hollywood. We're at Universal. And he says, I have singing lessons to do. I think you might like to come along. And I looked at him. I said, singing lessons? He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a singer. I said, okay. I rode down there with him, and I heard him go through his, you know, and, so, well, good luck. 
<laughs> well, you know, his tall, good-looking son, Finus, is a terrific singer, too. And I think Dean had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. King plays guitar, and he gets up there, and the women fall in love. These young chicks are all over yeah. this kid. I mean, tell you, he is good-looking. And, uh, I mean, if, if you saw George Strait as a younger guy, you'd think, hey, he looks a little like George. So, and he did a great job. Yeah. Finus does a great job. God love him. And, but Dean, you couldn't ask for a better friend. And he was always there for you if you needed him. I was raised up at a time when we t taught kids the difference between right and wrong and doing the right things. We don't seem to have that here anymore. For some reason, they've lost the blueprint of that. And I'm a firm believer that we ought to get back to the good old days. <laughs> Coming in from Arizona to talk about Dean Smith and also maybe to see a couple of doctors while he's here is Mr. Phil Spangenberger. Hey, Rob. Good to see you. <laughs> glad you're here, Phil. Yeah, and I'm always, always glad to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about your memories of Dean. Well, a couple of funny stories. I met Dean through Bruce Boxleitner, and we just struck up a friendship. And when I realized what he had done with his horses Sunday and then later Hollywood, I was, as a horseman myself, I was so impressed. I would never miss one of his performances. And I would always talk to him before or afterward. And we did a lot of several things together through the years. And uh, I, I, he called me up on the phone at Guns and Ammo magazine where I was working at the time. And he said... Um, he knew I did gun twirling and so on and Wild West shows and things. And he said, uh, if you're interested, I have a job for you. And I said, oh, what's that? There's a TV show called Parker Lewis Can't Lose. There's a teenage high school thing. And he said, they want you to do some twirling. I said, okay, well, what is it? He said, well, he said, I don't want to get involved with it. It's uh, you got to twirl power drills. <laughs> so he had me call I called the, uh, the producer and they said can you twirl power drills I said as long as it has a trigger guard I can do it and if it doesn't have a trigger guard I can only do half a twirl <laughs> so anyways I, went, I wound up I got the job they had to Polaroid, take Polaroid pictures of my hands I think I was in my 50s at the time and I had to represent a 16 year old kid so they wanted to see that my hands didn't look like my age, et cetera, and at that time they were okay. Um, but that was fun. I got the job, and uh, you ever look at one of the old episodes of that, Parker Lewis can't lose. You know what I say about that? Better power drills than chainsaws. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> and another, another time he, he came in, he wanted me to look at a Colt single action that he had, and he said, Phil, can you tell me if this thing's worth anything? And I said, well, bring it down to the office one day. So he did. He came in, sat in my office, and pulls out this single action. He said, just an old Colt that Dale Robertson gave me, and I want to know if it's worth anything. He pulls out an ivory-handled, nickel-plated, engraved Colt single action. I looked at the serial numbers, and I could tell it was made around the turn of the century. And I, I looked it up, and it was 1903, as I remember. And I said, yeah, this old piece has got some value to it. And because you're a friend, I'll be honest. <laughs> and it was, it's, you know, I don't, I don't know if they still have it, but I'm sure it's probably a $25,000, $30,000 gun. It was probably about ten or twenty at the time. Uh -huh. And um, he said, well, that's good news because I've had a bad day. And I said, what happened? He said, well, I'm on way day, my way down here, and I stopped somewhere like Vermont, Western, somewhere in that area, not a good area in L.A. And he went into a 7-Eleven to get a Diet Coke. And while he was in there, the store got robbed. And he got robbed. They took his, they took his presidential Rolex walks. And, uh, and I said, geez, that's, that's terrible, Dean. He said, well, luckily for me, I'm friends with the man who owns a 7-Eleven chain. And see, I called him right away and said, hey, I just got robbed in your store. And the guy says, really, what happened? And he said, well, I got robbed. That's what happened. And he said, they took my watch. And he's, long story short, the, the president of 7-Eleven uh, sent Dean a new watch. And I told him, I said, well, 
you're bound to be the the luckiest unlucky man there is. <laughs> so, but Dean, he was just a great guy, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, always there, you know. And I, I just always appreciated him getting me that job, and that was really great. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Thanks for having me. Will's down there in that brute, and Marina had to start chasing him down the down the street. And that was me on the back of the of the brute, you know, doing all this thing up and down. <laughs> anyway, um, now when you were doing the Olympics, you didn't have to wear a hoop skirt. Uh, did no, you? I didn't do anything like oh, that. Okay. You know, when you're running against them Russians, you ain't don't wear dresses. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Bruce Boxleitner. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to talk about Dean Smith. Um, a lot of people have weighed in on. Uh, the man, the athlete, um, what else can you say, uh, actor, um, a man who was in, who gave so much to his country and to our business. And um, a lot of these guys, as we all know over the years, uh, got forgotten by our industry. And I don't want Dean to be forgotten. He, uh, he was a very special man, a very special human being in which I don't know anyone that didn't like him. I don't think I've met the man or woman that didn't like him. Uh, he just had that kind of personality that uh, he made you smile. And with that unique voice and and uh, Western twang of his, it was just so endearing. I, I bet uh, most of the ladies would admit that uh, they kind of, you know, they thought he was pretty hot. <laughs> he was cowboy through and through. But uh, he was much more than that. He really knew the industry. He took pride in um, being in the movie and television industry, and he took pride in his work. And he was incredible. Uh, the reason I can say that is that he doubled me in 1977, 8, 9, I think, those three years um, on the ABC miniseries uh, he, uh, How the West Was Won, starring James Arness. And um, I played Arness's nephew, uh, Luke McCann. And many times, um, Dean had to uh, double me. I had a quite a, I had a, I had other stunt doubles for a while there. Then Dean came in, and he and Ben Bates worked wonderfully together. And Ben was a, a giant of a man, uh, only one of the few you could find in Hollywood that tall to, to double for James Arness and many of these stunt and riding sequences, and um, uh, so and and Dean did likewise for me. Now, back in the 1970s, I was wearing my hair very long, which they wanted for that period look, sort of a plainsman look, you know, that they had in the 1800s. And um, Dean had a a healthy head of hair. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't shoulder length or a little b uh, below, and um, so he had to wear a wig, and. Uh, I'd always hear him, you know, after the you know, kind of... He and Ben had to do a fight scene once where Zeb and Luke go at it, and they go across the farmyard and under the horses and everything like that. It was one of those great Western brawls, and they were so good at it. And um, I hear Dean under his breath, doggone wig, because he'd get up in a shot, and he had the hair somehow moved in the way it was right in front of his face. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, so, and some men, as they will tell you, always try to, um, and they're very clever at it, hide their face. So, you know, and then you would come in, the actor would come in later and do close-ups. So many times um, uh, in the old movies, you saw you saw the guy playing on and it didn't look like the lead guy at all, as you know what I'm saying. But anyway, Dean did that and he was he was great. But he, he could jump from standing flat-footed and mount a horse, literally by stra jumping straight up in the air and straddling. I've never seen anything like it. He had legs like these, you know, freaking springs, you know. And, um, of course, he was an Olympic runner and athlete. But more and more, more, more he, would, he would give me advice. I was young. I was in my 20s, mid to late 20s at the time he met me. And he gave me, you know... Uh, just every day something, a little tidbit of advice. And um, he'd seen a lot of young actors come and go. 
And I think I, I really valued his comments, his wisdom. We've done rodeos for him in Graham, Texas. Did a lot of the uh, Ben Johnson uh, pro celebrity rodeos with him. And um, he was always a showman and just a on great cowboy and a great human being. And uh, we miss him all. I know um, he's been ill for the last few years. And every time I saw him, I saw him, I think, the last time in Fort Worth, Texas, at the uh, on the openings of the uh, John Wayne Museum in Fort Worth. And he looked so sad. And I remember Debbie wheeling him in, and everyone was partying and laughing, and it was a loud, raucous bunch of people, great people. And um, she put him over just about outside of the, outside of the, the main room, sort of a big patio out there, and there were people out there. But he sort of sat there, and I walked over, and I, he just wasn't his good old Dean. You know, he just didn't, yeah, he was very sad looking. I sat down and just didn't say anything. And um, eventually he said uh, something to, you know, the fact of, uh, um, he's just some good people, something like that. And I said, yeah, they are. And they all love you, Dean. We love you. You know that, don't you? He said, yeah, you know. And he says, you know, he would always go on, uh, especially later on about how the business had changed so much. And, you know, he didn't, quite fit in and I said no no you've left an incredible legacy Dean and but we just sat there just a couple words back and forth and I hope uh, you know kind of pepped him up a little bit got his mind off of what he whatever he was dwelling on but anyway um, it was the last time I physically saw him I wasn't able to make the memorial uh, for him but when news of his passing I know we all, you know, when someone is sick for a long time, we all know inevitably what's going to happen. But when it does happen, it's a surprise. And I remember just how long ago I was sitting there. And, I, you know, I shed a bit of a tear. I really did. It's one of those people that really impacted your life. And um, you never forget them. And they, they touch something in your heart. So I always remember you, Dean.